All right. Last week. Last week. Isn't that crazy? It sure seems like it's been about 47 weeks this semester. It's been a crazy ride. So let me go over before we start the last chapters of the material. Let's talk about a few logistical pieces. So whether you're on campus or off campus, we are not going to have an on-campus final. I have made it available online. I, at this point, I don't know who's going to be in quarantine, who's not. Our cases are spiking up dramatically around the, the area here. And in fact, my kids just got off a two-week quarantine stuck with their mom because they managed to, to test positive and get exposed over, over Halloween. In their particular school, my daughter Gabby has, I think there's 21 students in class altogether. We had a note from her teacher that, we've got your material all ready to go. The five students that are still in class with me got to work on it. It's, it's a horrible problem right now, so we just moved the final online. It is actually available now, and I've actually had a couple of people have taken it already. So the final is available. So if you scroll all the way down, so it's, oh, let me move that up just a little bit so you can see it. Um, it's got to be done by November 25th, 10 p.m. That is our final deadline cutoff so that I can get grades in for this class. So the other piece then, and I'll send out an announcement, but I'll put it on here also, is Sunday night at midnight is also the last chance to go in and disengage because I have to move it all over manually, and that's a several multiple hour process to try to cleanse that data and move it over. Sunday night, I'm going to move that over, freeze it, so I can move that data over probably at Monday at some point when I'm working on it. So make sure you take the final. There's some stuff in week 14, and we're going to go over what's in there. So week 14 wraps up our course, and we talk about WAN technologies. There's a couple of lab simulations, some new and different things. One of them that I think is kind of interesting is that upload and download speeds, and so you can certainly see. And we've done some of those here in class, so that one shouldn't be a horrible thing. And then, of course, there is this quiz. Don't rush out of here and forget the quiz. There is also a discussion board this week, and it is the last discussion board that you have to do in this particular. Oop, if I clicked on the right thing. Trying to see through fogged up glasses, always fun. So there is a week 14 discussion board. So you're making an, a, a model of how to do troubleshooting for internet connection issues. Somewhere, chunk. So we started with the idea of a LAN. We've got MANs, we've had WANs, we've had PANs, and so we're going to finish on the WAN area. So all of our, all of our AN items. So a WAN is that is that connection point that we connect all these LANs together. So at your house. When you get an internet service provider, that is a WAN link. It is external to you. It is how you are getting your connection to the world. So when you go to select, even for your personal use, you have some decisions to make. So certainly the one that comes up a lot is a budget. How much am I going to spend for this, for this internet service? And most people look at it and go, well, I, I need the cheapest. But the reality is you need it appropriately sized. And depending on where you're at, that budget can affect what's available. So how far do I need to go to get internet service? What's available in my area? What kind of traffic load am I going to have? So if I have 12 people and they're all watching 4K Netflix videos all day long, I certainly need more inbound bandwidth than I do if I have one person that occasionally checks their email. And so that can, can affect my choices about what I want to do and what I want to look at. So, 
land wiring is typically almost always privately owned and in fact at the back of your house you can probably find a box where you get your internet service from either the cable company or a fiber optic company or a phone company and it will typically even call it the demarcation point and that box is interesting because you can open part of it so you can get to the inside portion but the vendor side is locked from there so lands and wans both use a lot of the same technology who owns it and it's really set up for a longer distance is some of that so network service providers internet service providers so around here so if I'm in Auburn I really have a couple of choices I have spectrum which is a, a cable wireless or a cable company I have windstream and I have locally in Auburn there's a company called a1 fiber in Nebraska City, there's a local fiber company. In Lincoln, there's a company called Allo. So we're starting to get a few more choices in terms of that. But we're going to look at some suggestions that may not even fit these. So we may have some other issues that are coming out. So this is what typically we look at. So here's our LAN point to point from each site. And here's our WAN. We're connecting geographically disparate areas. So we're connecting Auburn to Lincoln or Lincoln to San Francisco. So they, they're out of our control. We don't own that entire communications model from one spot to the other. So we're having to get it in some manner. To do that, we have to have something that connects us to that internet service provider. So if I have DSL service, they call it a DSL modem. If I have DSL, I have that. If I have a cable modem, they have a cable box that connects you. If I have fiber, you have some kind of head-end equipment. And so this is that demarcation line. We get everything to the left, and we get to set that up in our business or our house. On the right-hand side is all the internet service provider. Well, where that comes into to play is when something goes wrong. Who do I call? Is it something of my own? Is it something that the internet service provider has that went bad? And whose responsibility is it to fix that? So, on top of the communications that we can have, there are a couple of other things when we get into the bigger or in the business side. And we have to deal with the, a couple of terms. So one of the terms is having a dedicated service or line so at the college we actually pay for a dedicated fiber line that runs all the way to Lincoln in fact they have a couple of them that line is for exclusively for Peru State College they've bought the right to that fiber from here to there more commonly though is we have a virtual circuit so it appears to be a dedicated line but it switches through the internet service company's equipment. So there's a couple of types. There's a permanent virtual circuit. In other words, it's on all the time. And then there's one called a switched virtual circuit. In other words, it's available when we need it, but it's not being used continually. So they're a matter of cost. A dedicated line is the most expensive type of communications you can get. Whereas a switch line can be much, much more affordable because they're able to use it for other customers. So, you also can look at it from a switching standpoint. So, do we break it into packets before we transport it, or is it transported in whatever its native form is and then broken down into packets? So the reality is they're all packet switched. It's where we switch them into small enough packets. And again, circuit switched is going to be more expensive than a packet switched, where we already present that data that's already packaged up and send it through this, through this communications model. So we have a lot of different types of connections. So going really old school, we actually have dial-up where you actually dialed a phone number, it made a connection, 
Well, that worked. We got some data across. But it's slow. It required the dedicated use of a, a POTS line or plain old telephone service line. We moved into ISDN. ISDN is really kind of gone because some of the newer technologies. But the DSL and the cable broadband are probably the most common ways we connect. They're a shared medium in the sense that we're using some existing technologies and we're trying to reutilize it. So cable broadband works fairly well. Most common one in the United States for, for consumers. They are starting to upgrade everything to fiber. DSL is the same way. Originally it was over a copper line. Now they're starting to move to fiber when they can and when they can do that. So those two models can provide quite a bit of speed. The latest cable modems are capable over a gig per second. You can go buy from Cox the Gigablast or whatever they call it and get close to a gig per second down. What you share though or, or lack with the cable internet is you're sharing that with an entire group of your neighbors. And then we have more of the business end. So Metro Ethernet, T carriers and Sonnet are really how we're moving big data if you want to look at it that way. If I am Verizon and I'm setting up two data centers, I'm moving data not over DSL, I'm going to move it over something like a, a fiber optic sonic cable. The advantage to Metro Ethernet is it can move on a lot of different platforms as can T carriers. T carriers have somewhat kind of been taken over by the MPLS, but there still exists a need for them. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what that advantage is. So one of the advantages is to a T-carrier is I can get a T-carrier. I can call up Windstream and I can say I need a T-carrier, a T1 line or a T3. And we can generally get that anywhere that we need, even in cities that are typically underserved or areas. It was how when Peru needed a data line to its little center in, in Plattsmouth, or outside of Plattsmouth, that was the only way they could get into their learning center. And they're typically a little pricey, depending on that distance. And we'll talk about a, a value in there called the backhaul. So we've got that break. We say, this equipment belongs to the internet service provider. All your internal stuff is, is yours. So now we need to figure out something's gone wrong. Users can't get on the internet. Why, what is the problem? So we might need to check first, because if they roll out a truck and it's not on their side of the internet service provider, you likely will see a fairly hefty bill. So we need to figure out where that equipment is, what it is, and figure out some models that we can do to check that. So at that, at that demarcation, there's a lot of different terms for these things. So you may find a, a network box of some sort for fiber. You may find it for, again, for that cable. It may be a wired device. It may be a channel combiner if you're using a T carrier. So things you need to look for. Simple as, what if that device is unplugged? We're, we're out of the water. Does it have power? And the amount of times that things have happened that way, somebody unplugs something, pretty common. Other things to look for, things like, does it show an error? Does it maybe tell you? Some of the newest ones have a very descriptive panel on them that they will tell you what's wrong. Call in the internet for service provider and see if they can see an issue with their side. But you also need to look on your side. Is everything else working? Because if you have an error on the inside of your network, your router is down, it's not going to work no matter if you have a valid connection to that point or not. So you need to have enough troubleshooting tools to be able to tell the difference of where that's happening at. So on this idea 
of our WAN, we move on to this idea of the idea of the term broadband. And broadband is really not the term we want to use, but it's been accepted. So it drives me crazy. But what we're really looking for is how much thoroughput we can get out of our connection. So when I buy a service and I go to Cox Cable and I subscribe to their Gigablast that says up to one gigabit per second, what that's really telling me is they're going to try to get to that speed, but they're selling that same service to multiple, multiple customers, and I am probably not going to ever get that actual speed. I will may get close, but if my neighbors are all using the internet, they're also taking away that bandwidth. So they're feeding that, so think of it like a garden hose being split off into like three or four or five or 16 different garden hoses. If nobody else is using water, I've got plenty of water. But as soon as everybody else does, it starts to slow down. So there is no guarantee most of the time, unless you're buying a commercial account with Cox, or Windstream, you're not getting that dedicated bandwidth. It says up to, and if you get 40 megs per second and you're advertised 900, you still have that ability at certain times of the day to get up to their advertised speed. The other piece that's important for businesses is this, that bandwidth is what we call asymmetrical. You have a great download speed typically, but your upload speed is not nearly as fast. And so if you go out on your own home connection, and you can see this, you can see, all right, if I go to speedtest.net and I download, you'll see that your download speed is typically higher than your upload speed, in some cases by a huge margin. So it is pretty common to have a 50 meg per second download and a 1 meg per second upload. Because most of us on the, on the non-commercial side, you're pulling in more things, so you're going out and having Netflix stream. And the only thing you're sending out are really, hey, bring me the newest movie. You're not pushing a lot of data up. On the business side, we do some other things. So we may be hosting a website, which means that that data has to push out to a, a web server, or maybe we are the web server. You tend to do things like those cloud backups of very large data sets or moving it from one location to another. So for a business, we typically want symmetrical. We're going to pay more to get bandwidth that is essentially the same. So we may buy a 50 by 50 package, so our download isn't slow, is slower. We're not getting a, a gigabit, a thousand megabits per second. But we have that upload speed because for our business, that often is far more important, that ability to push data back up. And for a whole lot of reasons on the internet service provider side, it's more expensive to provide that. Especially if I put that service level or an SLA or an agreement that says, you are guaranteed to have 50 megs per second down and up. The same connection that you're going to pay for here, in, for let's use Cox, so for 100 bucks a month, I can get their Gigablast internet service down. But to get a 50 by 50 dedicated service is going to cost me about $350 to $500 a month. It's a significant amount more for that dedicated bandwidth. And there's some other pieces that go into that. And one of them is even the idea of service calls. If you've had to deal with your internet being down and calling Verizon or calling Windstream and you've got a $50 a month commercial or a business account, they're not really going to care. If you have an agreement with them that they get penalized, if you have a service level agreement, they'll roll that truck out on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, whenever they need to to get that back up. And so part of what you're paying for is you're paying for that symmetrical data and you're paying for that ability to get service at almost any time. You're guaranteed no more downtime. So we're going to go on a little history trip. So where the internet came from, 
It was back in the 1970s we really started the idea of we need some data. But what we had was this thing called the POTS lines, or the PSTN, the Public Switch Telephone Network. And you could make a phone call from anywhere in the country to anywhere in the country. It was a pretty amazing thing. But it was complex. So originally it was analog. We had to have a dedicated circuit for each phone call. And a switch room for a small town, even the size of Auburn, of 3,000 people, would actually be larger than this room that you guys are in here. And it's about a 20 by 40 foot room. So had very large switches. If you ever go on YouTube and, and look at switch rooms, or it's kind of a weird thing. You'll see some of them. And, and it's, they were very mechanical originally. It was analog traffic. Well, today, we've moved to digital. So the central office, that giant switching room for phone lines, has moved into the digital age. And now with technologies like VoIP and some, and some other things that are going on, it literally goes from a room 20 foot by 40 feet to one data stack, one rack, essentially 20 inches wide by 84 inches tall. And that's it. We've made a lot of progress in terms of that. But I will say that the phone quality is often much less. Well, the other thing that's happening in terms of development of this, who has a home phone line anymore? Businesses. Most people under age about 40, do they have a phone line anymore? No, they use only their cell phone. Now, we still need to switch those calls, but the technology is changing a little bit. So when we first came up with the idea of moving traffic, everybody had a phone line, and we could use that as a model to get data. And we still do on those DSL connections. So we have some terms that are kind of holdovers that we need to look at. And one of them is called the local loop, or last mile. Because that's where we have the hardest problem, is getting from that central office, that switch, all the way to your house. And so we do have all this old copper from the phone company, but it's a little harder now to send high-speed data over that. So now most phone companies, when they're upgrading, are moving to fiber optic. But it's expensive to install fiber optics throughout an entire city. Allo is literally spending hundreds of millions of dollars to build out a network in Lincoln. Even somewhere like Auburn, that's a 10 to $15 million project to provide fiber to every house. So there's some return on investment issues with this. So things you've seen before, you've had dial-up internet. You've picked up a phone at some point. So dial-up ISDN are pretty much gone. Hopefully your, your local phone company is moving to something a little, a little faster. They're putting in fiber. If they're not, you've got a really small old phone company that's not moving with that. You're going you're gonna to have an interesting life in terms of trying to get communication. And we end up with internet deserts. And we've seen those where small communities can't get on the internet. Well, now that we've had things like COVID and we've got people trying to work from home, it really makes a serious issue. And so we've spent a lot of money, you'll see, in the, in the, in the last election and people promising to try to end this internet issue. But I know of at least one, inter, one professor right in our building who has the his only option is to use a, a hotspot from the cell phone company that's very pricey to get data. And they're 20 miles from here, less than. So we have those, those deserts. So this is that idea of that local loop from the central office all the way to your house. That wherever it is, whether it's fiber, whether it's spectrum, and it's a cable, it's that idea from your house to that switching facility. It's called the local loop. If I'm using T technology, so T carriers, I pay for that service, and then I pay a charge based on how long that local loop is. Well, in some cases, the local phone companies don't provide T connection. So at a hospital I worked with, we got a grant, or they did, to put in a T connection for um, some teleconferencing. 
that local loop went all the way from Falls City to Lincoln. So the charge for that T1 was about $300 and then $4,000 in local loop charges every month. So it was a huge charge to get that local loop. So that local loop length makes some difference. And that's the most expensive piece of putting in that. So out here, if you have Windstream, or I think they now call it Kinetic, or whatever chain name change they're trying to run into, or you've got other phone companies that offer DSL, CenturyLink, for example. Um, you may have Frontier Communications. If you're in Iowa, there's a whole bunch of local phone companies that do the same thing. They offer something called DSL, Digital Subscriber Line. It runs over that, those lines that have been put in the ground. In most cases, it's still copper. So the, one of the bigger issues is this can't operate on very long distances. So over a couple of miles, DSL isn't very sustainable. So in order to get it to work, they have to put in repeaters. And that distance, how far you are from that central office and you, in terms of cabling feet, makes a significant difference on how much data you can actually get. So that digital signal sets on top of a regular phone line. So the one thing you typically get when they ship this to you and they say, hey, we're going to install this for you, is you get these little filters. And so your phone lines, you have to plug these little filters in so you don't hear any noise artifacts. It essentially it adds the data over the top of your existing phone line. So you can still use the phone at the same time you're, you're getting data. So until about two years ago, the fastest you could get in this town was about six megs per second. They have now come out with a model that actually they're getting closer to 40 or 50 megs per second. So we've got some improvements. It's still pretty reasonable. And the cost is reasonable. And in fact, if you're in Peru, you don't have a lot of other options, quite frankly. You have one internet service provider. And that's certainly the case in a lot of areas. So, we have a couple of different types. So there's ADSL, so that's the asymmetric. And most DSL is asymmetric. So in other words, it's got a really great download and a very crappy upload or slower, which is fine for most people at their house. But when you're uploading a huge assignment in Blackboard, man, I got the fastest internet package I have. How come it's taking so long to upload? Well, when I push data back out, they're, they're pretty slow. So Kinetics, plan down here, 50 megs down, has about one meg per second upload. So there's an issue. There are versions of DSL that are symmetric. They're usually sold to businesses, and they start to get very expensive. So Kinetic, when I tried to do a pricing just out of curiosity, to get a line that was in, in Auburn that was a 20 meg by 20 meg line, was going to be close to $1,000 a month. Ugh. Yikes. So it's more expensive to get that symmetric line. And if I'm a business and I depend on it, then I, I probably need to look at some other technologies if I have a need for very, very fast uploads. Best use for DSL in a business, though? It's reasonably cost effective to use that as my second internet service provider. So I have a backup, and it works pretty well for that. So what you have for equipment is you actually have this thing called a DSL modem at your house. And then the carrier uses something called a DSLAM, Digital Subscriber Line Access Module. What they have gotten the ability to do is sometimes you'll see them actually located around towns that have DSL service. There'll be a small green box about three foot high sitting on a little concrete pedestal. So they've moved those D slams out into like neighborhood so they can still manage to get that signal across their, their uh, shorter distances. So here's our issue is that distance less than about 18,000 feet. 
And that wire doesn't necessarily go straight from your house to that central office. Is 18,000 feet effective in the city of Peru? Probably. But if you think about a larger city, it's very hard to do that. So. This does have the advantage, though, of you have a somewhat dedicated line from you to the central office or that switching facility. The most common competitive product is cable broadband. So Cox, Spectrum, Charter Cable, whatever they've merged into at this point. So what they're trying to do is, is use, in most cases, the legacy equipment they have of that coaxial cable. And coaxial cable can transmit a lot of data. It's not a bad model. They use some standards, so you'll see the standard called DOCSIS, and now we're up to DOCSIS 3.0. And they are asymmetric, and those speeds have actually been passed significantly. So again, you can get nearly a gigabit download in a lot of places. It's great in that it pulls a lot of data down. It is not that fast going the other direction. So typically, very asymmetrical. So even though now we can get a gigabit down, you're still very limited in how much you can upload. So it's a little more complicated. And here's one of the downsides to this, is it's based on this idea of nodes. So your coaxial connections are all connected. You don't have a connection back to that switching facility that's completely independent. You're in an entire node, usually 8, 16, 30, however many they've built out into a node. You guys are really sharing that pipeline. So if all of your neighbors that are also connected are pulling down data, you can notice that speed dropping off really quickly. So they use this idea of these nodes out in neighborhoods, and then they connect those with fiber to connect those. It's still, I will say, probably a better option in most cases than DSL for, for your house. You typically get much faster internet speeds. Dealing with the customer service at either Sprint or a Spectrum or any of these will probably make your head explode. But customer service is kind of dropping across the board. It's kind of interesting. One of the things that you can do with this, that cable modem, the rental charge for that cable modem, so if they maintain it, that price has went up to about $15 a cable modem per month for most devices. It is perfectly legal for you to go buy your own cable modem at Best Buy, wherever Walmart even sells them. And you simply call them and say, I'm putting in my own modem. And here's the MAC address, that media access control address. That's all they need from you in most cases. And you can swap out your own cable modem. So if you spend $100, your payback period is pretty quick on saving some money on that cable modem. So it looks like this. A lot of them have some other, other features. They will have Wi-Fi included on it. Now, I'm a little weird. I like to run my own Wi-Fi and set it up separately. But if you're in a smaller house and you buy it all in one device, it works fairly well. If you're going to plan on running your own router, your own access points, and you have a little more elaborate network, so if I'm doing this as a backup for my business, for example, I probably want to make sure that they will sell me the ability to use what's called bridged mode. In other words, it passes transparently through. It doesn't do a lot of data manipulation before it gets there. So cable modem, it has that downside. We're all sharing the same local line. But typically, it's still faster than DSL. Well, now we move into more of a business-based internet services. So these are not going to be necessarily the cheapest option for you to get internet connection, but you have the ability to get a lot more bandwidth both up and downloaded. So
So we have some switching algorithms in Metro Ethernet. So there is a pathway. So similar to what we did with our routing, we typically have multiple redundant pathways. We're buying the use of that fiber from some group that is promising Metro fiber. Now Metro doesn't mean it has to be a large city. Even, even smaller cities, have, companies have developed that. In, the, in this state, there's a company called United Fiber or Unite Private Fiber that does some of this. There's, they're all over the place. But what it does is it allows your business to communicate and get onto the, the internet and slash other businesses very, very quickly. So if I have two locations downtown, it's a really quick way for me to connect those two locations. So it's very cost efficient. It's scalable in that I can get a larger volume of data very quickly. The hardware is stuff we're already familiar with. So it's actually a really good thing if we can, if we can do this. And then finally, we have this idea of T carriers. So T carriers came in. And we've all heard the, the term. If you watch enough TV, you'll hear the term, oh my god, we've got a T1 line. And they've, so there's different models of, of T connections. But the advantage is it can run on anything. It can go on fiber optic cable. It can be a wireless. So it can even be a microwave link. It can be fiber optic. It can be cable. It can be anything. It's how it operates over that. So when we first came out with T1s, and they first came out, this was a really great, great piece. So a T1 carries over two wires. And you've got to remember, this was a few years ago, but the advantage was it had that dedicated bandwidth. So it could carry 1.54 megabits a second. Well, when we were dial up at 33 kilobits a second, this is an amazing revolution. But the other thing it did, the other thing it did was allowed you to set up channels. So the standard T carrier, you could divide up into voice channels or data. And so when we have our own phone lines in our business, we need multiple phone lines. So you could set up 10 phone lines out of it and use the rest for data. So we moved into this model. Nearly every carrier supports it. It gives you a big chunk of data you can get. So a T3 line then is about 45 megabits per second, bi-directional. So that was big data back then. Or hundreds of phone lines if you needed them. And then you could break it up. So if you only needed four phone lines, you could actually break that fractional T1 up. So it allows you to carry from one company, one place to the other. You could carry out data and voice simultaneously. So that's kind of the advantage that it had for a lot of businesses. Somebody like Peru, where they need 20 outgoing phone lines, this is a model that we can, we can use to get that. And you can get it nearly anywhere. So there's a couple of terms that we need to look at. So a channel service unit. So there's a lot of different terms you're going to see for them. Terminal head end equipment. So that digital signal, that's where it stopped. And then they have something called a DSU. And that DSU took the digital signal in the T format and converted it into Ethernet frames. So it would convert it back and forth. The other piece that's in here that's interesting is something called a multiplexer. So that multiplexer let you put multiple signals on a single pair of wires. So in this case, it let you put 24 sets of signal down a single wire. Well, that was really kind of amazing because we didn't have to have one wire for each set of those signals. We didn't have to actually have 24 pairs of cable to do that. So we had a multiplexer and a demultiplexer. 
So we, the signals would all go in, get scrambled together, and on the other end they would come out. And you would be able to pull those apart. So that's where it got really, really interesting. So here we have our data, we have our telephone, all of it connecting through the internet connection we have and into our internet service provider slash phone company. So T carriers are really an amazing piece. We don't use them as much now, but it's a way we were able to, to combine these two attributes. We needed both phone and we needed data. Well, we've moved on, and one of the things we've moved on to is something called Sonnet. So Sonnet sets on fiber, and one of its biggest attributes is the ability to form loops, because it's very fault tolerant. We have, we form very large Sonnet ring loops, and as people get in or those connections break, it's very fault tolerant. It can reconfigure very, very quickly. So Sonnet rings, we can get 40 gigs per second or more very easily. So that's how we typically now the phone companies or the internet service providers or the people providing data in the United States, the high speed data is actually that's how it's going through our our network. So Sonnet takes in data, formats it to its suspected format, and re recombines it then onto send. So to get in and out of it, we need a, a multiplexer and a demultiplexer again, specific for that fiber. But the amount of bandwidth we can get. So here's all our incoming channels. That Sonnet sends it out, so it multiplexes, shoves them together, and then unmixes them at the end. So we can share a lot of data. When I look at when you're connecting to almost anything, it's going over a Sonnet ring. And so very large internet service providers and or just data providers this is what they're building around the country. So we just had a company called Zio come from Dallas all the way to Omaha. Well, they're going to make separate rings. So it's going to go to Des Moines and then down a little bit and make a ring around. And so those rings provide you that redundancy. So even if you have a backhoe cuts into the fiber at one location, it'll actually work in the other because it'll it'll say, "Oh, we're we're sending those signals, and they're based on timing around that loop. And so if one signal doesn't get there, we can actually pull it from the other side. One of the things that's interesting to me about this is sonnet frames. So our, our LAN frames, when we built them and shoved it all together, are variable in size. Sonnet frames are all the same size. So for efficiency, we build them all to the same size, pack them up, and send them on their way. And so it gives us some, some efficiency. So who's using this? Well, telephone companies, internet service providers, long distance companies, data providers. This is really the state of the art. And that connection size is based on something called an OC level, optical carrier level. And so there's a ton of different styles of of optical carrier levels all the way from an OC1 to an OC768, which is at 40 gigs per second, which is a huge amount of bandwidth. A 768 could transmit the entire contents of the Library of Congress digitized in about a minute from one end of the country to the other. So it's a huge amount of data that we're able to push through there. So we have some other technologies that are out there. And so we already kind of mentioned MPLS a little bit. So there's really a couple. There's frame relay. There's called ATM or, or asynchronous transfer mode. 
and MPLS. And so these are a layer two technology. So same as what our switches are on our network, if you want to think about it that way. And we can use those to connect our LANs over some kind of a WAN connection. So we, we rent a circuit or we rent a frame relay circuit. We can rent it by the size we need. Frame relay, we can also say whether we want it permanent the circuit or do we want to just have it available when we need it. So frame relay is one of the first ones we can use. Frame relay has a really good advantage of it's a connection oriented, just like those TCP packets. Everything gets a little check that says, yep, I got your data. Yep, I got your data. So frame relay, you may see an internet service provider say, hey, I can offer frame relay. So look like something like this. So that frame relay then, each connection, and then we have a in this case, at the top, they're showing it's a logical private virtual connection. So in other words, we own that. We don't control where it goes and how it gets there, but we own that connection from the branch office to the main office. So we're renting that the entire time. We don't care how it gets there. We just are renting that channel from one location to the other. So that means we only pay for what we use. Because it's an older standard, it's probably a little cheaper. But one thing as a takeaway, connection services are not necessarily cheap. We're still going to pay some significant money to get these branch offices connected. So we have some other options. So we actually have one called ATM. Now, ATM is interesting. ATM does something a little weird to me. It forms a little packet. So other technologies make as big a packet as possible because they think that's more efficient. ATM actually breaks your data down into little 48 byte cells. And they have a very tiny header, a five byte header is all. And so it breaks them into very small pieces and sends them out very quickly. They're all the same size. They all get packaged to the same way. So there's some advantage to that fixed packet, but it's smaller. So some data actually works really, really well. You're not seeing as much ATM traffic as you used to. And the reason's going to come up here in a second. We'll show you. So small packet size means we're going to have more overhead as a percentage, but we can send them very quickly. It does allow some quality of service guarantees. So I can mark specific packets or specific pieces of data that need actually a, a faster delivery or an in-sequence delivery. And so I do have some quality of service with ATM. So this would be sort of what that looks like then. So you have your router, it goes out to that ATM switch, it goes across your internet service provider, and then comes back into your router. So we could set quality of service. So in this case, they said VoIP server. So your voice, your phone system has high priority. Maybe your email server has a low priority. So we can assign priorities. But what I'm seeing more when we look at companies and how they start to move data is you're seeing this term, MPLS, multi-protocol label switching. Blah, that's a mouthful. So what it really means is I can send all different kinds of things together and I can still put it over so I have a little bit of overhead. So it doesn't matter what kind of data we send on it for the most part. So we send and package it up however we want to, and it sends across this MPLS network. So we grab those frames that we had again of all different kinds of data, and we put a little label on them about where it's going to go. It can also have a QoS. So here we have 